Welcome to the Conditional Release Program, a podcast that delves into the nether world of cults, crims and con artists. We don't like these people in the shows. We believe the best way to expose them is to hold them up to a harsh light, point our index fingers in their general direction and mock them mercilessly, take them down a peg or two until they cease to exist in any other form than the shit on our shoes. I'm Jack the Insider, otherwise known as Peter Hoisted for tax purposes. And I'm Joel Hill, and in today's Conditional Release Program, we're taking a look at the next major crisis that's facing the planet, and one that has been blatantly ignored by the Western mainstream media, which is a global food shortage, which is going to push millions into poverty, malnutrition, and outright starvation. Now, Joel, it's not the mainstream media's job to bum people out about the pause, because look, there's a cat who plays table tennis. She's very good at it too. Yes, she is very good, and that is news. But a global food shortage that may result in the deaths of many, I just... But the cat is so good at table... I can't, you, stop, I can't stop looking. How does it work? It's ridiculous <laughs> and it makes me so happy. But unlike the lamestream media, we are actually going to bum you out in our regular call for financial support so we can keep bringing the conditional release program to you, our dear, beloved listeners. Joel's down to his last pack of Scruttock's old dirigible strawberry and mango sour beer and my cat can't play ping pong. Yes, that's soured in a foda, my friend. But, yeah, to keep my craft beer habit alive, please get behind us because it's not cheap. And for as little as five cells a month, you could be feasting on all manner of behind-the-paywall content, true crime investigations, and stories of cookers behaving really badly. So join up at patreon.com slash the conditional release program, and thank you. And while you're reaching for your credit cards to keep the show on the road, we're moving on. On with the show, and that means it's time for the conditional release program's weekly news. So it's been a while since we gave a cooker update because, quite Mm. frankly, the remaining dregs of the movement are a bunch of cringy hippies who have just got (laughs) so used to yelling at buildings all day and dancing in parks all night that they're just unable to return to reality. Yeah, yeah, it'll get you. I will admit, it it does look like fun. I love a good music festival, but it's not wholesome fun. It's weird, sad, death cult fun. Death cult, yeah. That's what it looks like. It's not good. So the big thanks to Soz149, Ken Barron, Anani Katz, Tally Hose, and the rest, there's millions of you, for digging through these reams of terrible content and giving us these bite-sized morsels to digest, I couldn't do it otherwise. Because honestly, even the little two-minute videos you guys dig from the hours and hours of endless content, <laughs> it's just, it's enough. I can't do handle it. Editing. I well, do like it. I'm in at 30 and I'm like, nah, I got the message. I'm going to put that in the podcast. <laughs> Fucking hell. And I feel so bad for the cops on the scene because they can't just turn the video off and walk away. Close tab, close tab. That's what I'd be thinking. So Canberra is still full of cookers, and many of them are living at a chicken farm called the Hatchery. Despite an absolute plethora of biosecurity laws. See, si, see, si, a plethora. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> they are almost certainly breaking. They remain in a bizarre freedom camp, which is essentially a commune of broke lunatics surrounded by chicken poop. It's just, <laughs> it's not great. It's not it's great. It's kind of where you, where you don't want to be. Yeah, I know. Like, I would rather be in an internment camp. So their schedule generally consists of yelling at the Governor General's house across a lake and dancing on the Parliament House lawns to stupid music and bad anti-vaxxer yeah, rap. And yeah, it, it is, is bad. It bad. Is bad. It's so bad. Oh, but it's getting cold in Canberra. I oh, mean, yeah. really fucking cold. I'm cold in Sydney. Uh, you know, I'm a pussy when it comes to this shit. At one point, the sprinklers were turned on, and a few cookers got a very cold shower. <laughs> oh, oh. I mean, I'm not sure if this was intentional to give them a bit of a spray, or it was just simply timed irrigation because you know grass needs water. It's actually quite terrifying, though, how unmoved they were in the video <laughs> footage, just being soaking wet in their underwear and just in like no clothes. It's eight degree weather. It's just like, oh, that was nice. No, it wasn't, you <laughs> psycho. But this is the thing. Like these are, They're living in freezing cold conditions. They've got no resources. Their leadership is chaotic at best. And they've created this death cult of zombies that simply just refuse to go home and rejoin society. Go and get jobs. So send a text to your families. Yeah. Many of these people are staying up all night on the lawns to protest. And there's this sort of clever way to get around the laws on sleeping on lawns. It's not camping if you're not <laughs> sleeping. That's not smart. Oh, it's just nuts, isn't it? You know, it's terrifying. It's like, this is our divine right to sleep on lawns by not sleeping. <laughs> Fuck me, dude. And the thing is, like, you know, they're not taking turns of, like, sleeping at a hotel. They're taking turns sleeping in cars. And these are at random hours. These aren't circadian rhythms. This is fucked. And they're generally not bathing or just taking care of themselves at all. And I know they love their immune systems. It's a big thing. They put on a little Facebook badge. But seriously, they are leaning on them 
way too hard right now. I mean, I'm not even worried about COVID here. There's a million things that can cause you harm when you simply just sort of give up. And they, they seem to have just done that. They, they, they just, yeah, they've just resigned it's to death filth. Death cult time. It really is. So, of course, all this is simply in pursuit of the 28 names, the homophobic <laughs> dinosaur Bill Heffernan hinted towards in his dopey little speech. And they really just want to know who the 28 names are. Evidence? Who needs fucking evidence? We make that shit up and then we lynch them. Yeah, it looks like, looks like there's some of them 28 might be there in that building. Yep. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to yell at as a result. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it out. So, like, of course, that's why the names are suppressed. If you look up the Snowtown murders, if like to get some reasons why these people shouldn't know about who is on that deranged list of just defamatory accusations that are all, I'm sure, completely baseless. He's a gay, he probably likes kids, is the extent of the fucking thing. Mm-hmm. A mainstay of these guys is the frozen bank account thing. Since Dave O'Neill had his bank account, everyone it's wants it. very popular, hasn't it? Yeah. It's all the cool kids. So, <laughs> at the incredibly sad freedom gathering in Bondi on the weekend, yeah. Yet another cooker claimed his bank accounts were frozen, and obviously it's made up. Like it's just, it's. Not I have my bank account frozen too. Yes. I have. <laughs> Send me Bitcoin. Like just fuck off. But back in Canberra, Guru, who had his accounts frozen as well, allegedly mm-hmm. told allegedly. a very small crowd, but still, of course, used a microphone because you know why not? Okay. 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 He, he called the bank and found out the wall. Mel called the bank and found out that the reason his bank account was frozen is this is great because someone with the <laughs> same name as him is a pedophile. It's not. It's not a reason. So, like, okay, so you call the bank and you're like, "Oh, why are my bank account's frozen?" And the person on the line. Well, I'm afraid uh, you uh, share the name of a, a known pedophile, so we froze your bank account. Mm, yeah. No. Like. No, that's not how the conversation went, Guru. <laughs> that's just not how society fucking works. So he did He did go on, quite fair, and he said that uh, why would a pedophile have their bank account frozen? I mean, huh. that's a it's, good question. It's a good question. That's a good question, Guru. It makes no sense. I totally agree. You made all of that up. Imagine <laughs> just, just, just from go to woe, the you, whole thing. Just like, no, there's no way. The person on the, anyway. So like, look. You don't have to worry about this, though, because the mystery will all be revealed soon. Guru has someone high up in the alliance looking into it. It's one of their white hats. That's a QAnon thing. So it will all be sorted out soon. I think he's made that bit up too. Do you think so? Do you think? Yeah, because white hats like are the thing. So I guess that's a hint. So look. The camera cook has had this clash with these client protesters. And I'm going to say client protesters because, well, actually, they were high school children. (laughs) And climate change is this huge trigger for these people because, of course, they've been going on and on about geoengineering and weather manipulation of the New World Order recently, blah, 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 Dave O'Neill's, blah, 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 Lismo, blah, blah, blah. So the fact that cookers had to share their space with some kids protesting in action on climate change really fucked them up. They didn't (laughs) like it. The police asked them to turn down the music, which is just trash. And they did, reluctantly, after arguing with them for minutes, (laughs) talking about the right to protest, the fact that... Right Why do we need permits? Music. Oh, they've got permits. Why do we need permits? And the cops are just like, just don't be pricks. Like, you know, you're just yeah. not being nice. Just be just be normal. To children. So, of course, unable to help themselves because that's what they're like, they proceeded to join the climate protest. Not join as in, yeah, climate action. More like, ah, oh, this is all about us now. <laughs> they put signs about pedophiles near the climate protest signs oh. to make it all about them. They screamed bullshit about weather manipulation because they had to make it all about them. And, of course, one of the cookers pushed a guy, no less, in the back because they're just inherently shitty people. It was an old guy. Oh, and dear. It's just, it was one of the cookers. I'm not going to name him. It's just, just fucking absurd. So, look, the situation in Canberra is set to change with the hatchery apparently getting issued a legal order for the campus to move on, which Uh-oh. is a good thing because this is not yeah. healthy. They it's responded to this. plague, you know. And yeah. We'll have our next, next visitation of the Black Death. Diphtheria. Typhoid? I mean, really? (laughs) It's just ridiculous. So, of course, responding to this uh, legal threat, they apparently barricaded the driveway. So, Mm. like, I mean, is Quimby in the next Waco? Is that what we're going to be? Is that, you know? boots are made for walking. Yeah, well, (laughs) maybe you should walk home. So it wouldn't surprise they started a siege, but, I mean, who fucking knows? It would be great content if they did. One tractor, one bulldozer, that would be the end of them. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, it'd be very one-sided. So, like, there was a protest in Melbourne. It was a thousand oh. or so cookers making noise. Who gives a shit? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. That. But they're still going. That's that's the summary of that. 
The thing that will close this out is some, what I would say is pretty good news because we reported on this at the time when a cooker from the Epic camp back in February when they were doing that big protest, mm-hmm. went to the race course adjacent to the campsite and went looking for a PA system, you know, because I can, you know, scream cooker bullshit over the loudspeakers, wake up the normies in the stands, but he got caught. And instead of sort of accepting his lot and leaving gracefully or, you know, just trying to talk his way out of it, he allegedly assaulted a 67-year-old woman, fracturing Ooh. both her wrists, which required surgery. Charming. So after a lengthy investigation, he's finally been caught up with, apprehended and addressing Kings Langley in New South Wales, Hello. and is up for trespassing and, uh-oh, recklessly inflicting grievous bodily harm. That's serious. That's serious. Yep, 20 years. That could be a problem. So mm-hmm. in summary, they are still yelling at buildings. They're still being belligerent and annoying toward cops. They're still making up reasons to be upset that may or may not be true. But except for the occasional funny moment, it's just a bit sad. And I tried to find the funny bits because I thought, oh, this has been a weird week. It really is death cult stuff. It's just sad. The police even sent social workers to the Parliament Lawns to check on some of the people there. And, of course, it was met with that usual blanket opposition to authority and just pointless argument. Like, this is their life now. It's all about the 28 pedos. It's all about fucking geoengineering. And, like, I just don't see what's going to bring them back. I don't. Don't know if these people oh, can come back. There's no coming back. There's no coming back. Sending a social worker is just not going to cut no, it. That's, that's it's not, not enough. It's not going to do it. No. no. And in other cooker news, Monica Smith is really, really stupid. Oh. Wait, that's not news. We already knew that. <laughs> we did. But the newsy bit is the RDA's resident Sheila Mussolini with great <laughs> hair has been urging her followers, and she's down to about a cricket team's worth now, and by the election, is by the time the election is over, she'll be struggling to get a four together for a great game of euchre. But she's been urging that diminishing group to put the majors last. She has, she has. And she's really made it easy for her followers by asking them to download and print some How to Vote Senate cards from her website and hand them out at polling booths to registered voters. I love it. I what love an it. idea. Just what a getting fucking... The- Political genius she is with her great hair. Try not to pay attention to the funny eye, Joel, although it is a bit hypnotic. It is. I mean, look, you know, I've got a bit of a soft spot for Monica. She's a nice-looking lady, but uh, the eye, really, you can't help but to look at it. You just can't help to look at it. <laughs> it's one of those things. And and the more you tell yourself not to look at it, the more you find yourself actually looking at yeah, it. Yeah, like it's just says, one of those things. Don't think of pink elephants. And all of a sudden, my head is full of pink four-footed fuckers. <laughs> Anyway, besides the funny eye, there is just one problem. Monica is really stupid, as we said before, and she appears not to understand how our quota preferential voting system works in electing the nation's senators. Look, in Monica's defence, the quota preferential system is pretty fucking complicated. (laughs) Only three people know how it works in the country. Uh, One's Anthony Green. uh, The other's that smart-ass nerd in the bow tie on the chase. And the third is Tasmanian sophologist Dr. Kevin Bonham. Uh-huh. Uh, Bonham took a look at Monica's terrific plan and tweeted the following. Joel! While there is no problem with them handing out how to vote cards, their linked major's last site contains some misleading material about the impact of voting in certain ways, and in cases the cards themselves will be misleading. If you pick a major, which includes Greens, that you preference last time, it will put that major below all the parties it likes but still gives them a number which is not putting them last. Correct. Mm. In Diva Tasmania, if in the Senate I say that I like Sustainable Australia and preference the Liberals last time, then it gives me this how to vote. One, Sustainable Australia. Two, Shooters. Three, I'm Op. Four, One Nation. Five, Liberal. So it not only omits seven non-major parties, (laughs) including UAP and LDP, whoops, but has even recommended a vote that has to be saved by the savings provision. I suggest that since the site purports to be a way to put major parties last but delivers how to vote cards that don't actually do that, it could be in violation of Section 3291 of the Commonwealth Electoral Act. Uh Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There was a lot of big words in that. Yeah. Yeah, because a very smart man is Dr. Kevin Bonham. He's absolutely right. So if you're voting above the line and you put the majors fifth, you're going to exclude everybody else and worse... Because, let's say, shooters and IMOP are not going to get very high preference counts themselves, they will exhaust and you'll find that you've actually, on Monica's say-so, put the libs third, for example, or Labor third, for example. Yeah, yeah. So just according to the recommendations that she's made, look, it's a big ballot, you know, lots of options. And if you're voting over the line, you've got one to five. That's how it works. 
could it be that Monica is in reality a pimp for the major parties, Joe? Yes. Or is she, as we reported before, just really, really stupid? Yes. The jury's out. We might have to bring them in because the AEC has referred it to their legal department for consideration. Ooh. Oh. Monica might have to plead ignorance because ignorance is an excuse before the law. Being numbingly idiotic, a chronic moron is a defence. And a good one too. Either that or flutter the lashes on her funny eye at the magistrate and see how she gets on. It's worked before. Anyway, listeners, that's the take-home message. Breaking in breaking news, Monica Smith is really, really stupid. I'll do anything for you. And today's condition release program is proudly brought to you again by the United Australia Party. The party that bought us lock, stock and barrel a few months ago has bought us lock, stock and barrel again. Good. They should have really gone the full ad package, Joe. <laughs> We'd be wearing lovely new yellow t-shirts too. I have no problem with this. Just saying publicly, I will sell out. Listeners, UAP is more than a political party. It's a vehicle. A vehicle for an obscenely <laughs> fat, even more obscenely wealthy man to increase his political influence over the country so he can mine asbestos and finally get those asbestos lined tube socks off the drawing board and into the marketplace of a grateful nation. <laughs> Listeners, Australian asbestos is the best darned asbestos in the world. I like milk on mine. While well, Job prefers to eat it straight out of the box. And mm-hmm. Clive wants to dig it up, put it on a burner and send it to the Chinese so they won't catch fire when they're fucking around with their nukes while they're rebuilding the Pacific in their own image. Four-lane highways in Honiara, you know it makes sense. Oh, yeah. And it can't be done with without good old Australian asbestos just lying around in the outback waiting to be dug up. Listeners, when you get out and vote, and you can do it every day, up to and including May 21, why not vote to improve the fortunes of a billionaire who, if you stood between him and a bucket of money, would run you over in Hitler's staff car? (laughs) Just because it's classy. (laughs) A vote for UAP is a vote for Australia. Close Australia. You just live in it. Yeah, we're getting sued. I think one of the first things it says within the Constitution is all laws within all... Within. And with the easy listening sotto voce tones of the always laid back people's prodigy Phanos Panietes lapping gently against their eardrums, it means it's time for which Black Bill fuckwit said that? The quiz show that catalogues the pointless gibberish of fuckwits the world over and vomits it back up again in multiple choice question and answer format. If in doubt, always go the B. That's my advice, Joel. Mm. And if you're successful in today's which black pill fuckwit said that, you'll get mesothelioma and die horribly coughing up a lung, but happy that you've added to the huge pile of cash and prizes Clive Palmer sits on every day and masturbates while laughing like a drain at how fucking stupid Australians really are. That's a winner. It actually runs in the family, so uh, I've, I've got that going for me. <laughs> All right, our first quote comes from listener Harrow. G'day, Harrow, you're a champion. Well done. And this is the quote. Do you know how many, many um, volcanoes there are under the water? A million. A million that are releasing all this carbon dioxide out of this and warming the oceans. And then we have another thousand above ground on land. These are volcanoes. So this is what we're contending with. So it's a war on volcanoes. That's war what I'm looking on. at. Damn you, volcanoes. <laughs> Who said this? Was it eminent scientist and ghost leader of ghost candidates, yeah. Pauline Hanson? Was it eminent scientist and mouth-breathing carbon dioxide emitter, Teeny Weeny Malcolm Roberts? Or was it eminent scientist and constitutional law specialist, Phanos the Manos? Or was it eminent scientist and natural history specialist, David Attenborough. Well, I did see someone claim that apparently there's been a hundred eruptions of these volcanoes in the past 11,000 years, and therefore we shouldn't be hugely concerned. A million, about a million, a million. A million. <laughs> well, that's pretty concerning. Uh, Paul and Hanson. It was not job. Excellent work. Excellent research. Very, very good at just keeping up to date with cookers generally. Yes, it was, in fact, Pauline. And when I got that quote from Harrow, I had to ask, is this teeny-weeny or is this Pauline? 
But then, yeah, yeah, I think I did read it in my best Pauline Hanson voice there for a sentence or two, which probably helped you along. But, but yes. Teeny Weenie had a great quote this week, which I thought you were going to put in there. I thought I was going to get a freebie on that. Oh, yeah. Look, I know the one you mean. Yeah. Maybe uh, use it next week because it really is fantastic. And in my opinion, just a, just it's timeless. Fan, it's timeless. Fan, yes. It's not time critical anyway. No. So, really uh, look, uh, we'll see if we can find that for you. But I think you might already have the answer to Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Just give me a freebie. Don't be stingy. You might find uh, this one terribly easy too. Mm. It is quote two. I could be wrong, but Hitler also had Jewish blood. Oh, wow. The fact that Zelensky is Jewish means absolutely nothing. Wise Jewish people say that the most ardent anti-Semites are usually Jews. Oh. Unquote. Look at you, John Safran. Was that head of Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, is he plotting a coup? He always is. Alexander Bortnikov. Mm. Or was it used to flying around the world making mischief but now can't leave Russia or it's off to the Hague? Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Mm. Or was it that 60 millimeter artillery shell that hit me on the head and exploded was just a scratch? Head of the Russian army, not seen publicly for more than a month, Valery Gerasimov. Mm. Or was that citizen journalist, but is he a Russian citizen or an Australian citizen? Simeon Boykov. I don't know. I know Lavrov says some crazy one? shit, but I'm just going to wow. go with Boykov. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no this is Sergei Lavrov. Uh, this is the well, Russian foreign minister. He says yeah. crazy shit. I should have gone with that. I just, Actually, Putin you know, apologized to the Israeli prime minister over those words. Amazing. Yeah, that is uh, really quite a fucked up thing to say. It is really an amazingly fucked up thing to say. Jesus Christ. And, of Christ. course, it's part of the... Oh, well, you know, we're, we're, we're fighting Nazis. Hang on just a minute. Um, the president of Ukraine is, is Jewish. Oh, well, oh, this is how that goes. Uh, Hitler was also Jewish. He's a self-hating Jew and he hates the rest of them too. That's right. Yeah, dear, oh dear. Oh All right. God. Well, that's bad. That's bad news. <laughs> your, your lungs are looking clearer by the minute. I tell you what, I've done some labouring in the past and I also uh, did take a slingshot to my neighbour's home, which was covered in asbestos. So to be honest, nature might just take its course anyway. <laughs> well, if, you, if you've if you got just that microscopic fragment of asbestos in your lungs, you're cooked. You're cooked, me old China. It could be doing its work right now as we speak. All right. Well, this is a very, very short, uh, very, very short um, quote here. And it simply says, no comment. Ooh. Was it UAP leader and the next Prime Minister of Australia when faced with a clinical study that proved ivermectin had no benefit as a COVID treatment? Oh. Crackers Kelly? Or was it the UAP real leader facing charges of two counts of fraud and two of failure to discharge his duties as a director, Clive Palmer. Oh, dear. Was it UAP candidate for Higgins facing 13 charges, including using a carriage service to menace or harass another person, Ingram Spencer? Mm -hmm. Or was it FON candidate in Banks and Australian Federation Party candidate in Brandt? That's in WA, Banks is in New South Wales. When one nomination is barely enough, Malcolm Heffernan. All the above. <laughs> you might be right, mm -hmm. but it's definitely the response from Ingram Spencer, who was locked up over a week ago, and he still hasn't faced court. His oh, parents fuck. actually sent, uh, provided him with some legal uh, counsel, and they can't get him to speak either. Oh, every, every time they go and say, Mr. Spencer, then the cops will come in and go, Mr. Spencer, you, you have a court date today. He just rolls over in his cell oh, my and God. pretends he's asleep. That's so, like, that's what you do when you're a kid. Your mum comes in <laughs> and she's like, Joel, you've got school. No, I'm asleep. I've got a stomach ache. <laughs> That's what Ingram Spencer is doing right now. That is insane. That it is. is very, very funny. And he's refusing. He could, he could end up being Australia's longest serving prisoner just by sheer weight <laughs> saying, it's your court date. Um, we have your court date today. Uh, I don't feel well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got a headache. I'm asleep. I'm asleep. I'm, asleep. Yeah, wanna, I'm speaking of asleep. I don't know. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yes, yeah, very, very funny. What an idiot! He's a real fucking cooker. And that brings us to an end uh, uh, of uh, which black pill fuckwit said that. But we're going to stay with fuckwits. Free fuckwits on the land and the tiny bit of land they have where they park their van down by the river. That's right, folks. It's time for Sovsits v the man. 
We fired you. We sacked you. We dismissed you as what? As garbage, because that's all you are. You're a criminal. You're a traitor. And you're going to the biggest barbecue in history. So from Christmas dinner to you are the dinner. Thank you. That's what I'll go with. Listeners, we have some breaking news regarding the charges against Turtle and Saviour, Wayne Glue, over in Western Australia. This is from Mona Pamela. And before you dismiss this as hearsay, you should know this. Mona has studied the common oh, law. Well, there you go. And here's what she said. I just seen on the news that Wayne Glue has his charges dismissed on grounds the amendments to the criminal code were assented in the name of the fictional Queen of Australia, and that the Australia Act 1986 is beyond federal legislative power. The magistrate recused himself straight after, admitting that he has mistakenly taken an oath to a corporate entity instead of the monarch and is now involuntarily admitted to mental health for severe depression. That sounds sounds, sounds likely, Joe. This is crazy. Like, maybe they were right. All along. (laughs) They've had a win. She studied the common law. She definitely knows this. And, you know, so just to give this a bit of credibility, and this was reported on the 2022 official convoy to Canberra Terror Australis Telegram account. And this is what the uh, convoy to Canberra Terror Australis Telegram account said in part. This is evidence that every act and statute since the fictitious Queen of Australia was introduced is fraudulent and any dash all using the fraudulent acts dash statutes are guilty of misprison of treason. Yep. They, they never get the spelling right on. That's right. It's misprision. It's an I after the S. It's misprision, you fucking empty-headed cunts. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, 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 everyone. Sorry. Uh, but, like yeah, it. they always misspell it. It's like it's a prison, right? So it must be a misprison. Yeah, exactly. Because yes. they, don't, they don't care what it means. They just think it sounds cool. And it, it does sound cool. kind of cool. It does. So there was another one, like there was another slightly sceptical member of the group who chimed in with this. I hope we can get a bit more info on this win. <laughs> to which the admin of the group replied, Chasing it up now. Hopefully we'll get the transcript. If I can, it will be posted here. Oh, this is huge news, guys. Huge, huge. This is just huge. See, Wayne was up for 14 years for telling his minion to kidnap the Premier of West Australia. Yeah. But at the bloody last minute, the judge did his own research, realised his entire life was a lie. <laughs> he's, he's, he's been treated for depression now. He too. is. He is. He's been treated. He's been admitted to mental health. I mean, he's now on a diet recommended by the esteemed Canadian psychologist Jordan B. Peterson, which is a shitload of meat and a whole bunch of clonopin. He should be better in a couple of weeks. He'll be, you know? he'll be fine. He'll come up. He'll Are you good yet? Here's some more clonopin. See you later. Don't don't drive any motor vehicles. If you drive <laughs> motor vehicles on clonopin, bad things happen. Someone out there knows what I'm talking about. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's an Easter egg. The news wasn't universally accepted as fact, at first at least, with some idiots claiming this wasn't oh. true. I mean, come on. Why, you're an why idiot. Why are people so cynical? I, exactly. Another Telegram user put the haters in their place by saying, If there's a post you don't like, scroll by. If there's info you believe is incorrect, then if you can, provide documents, (laughs) decent titles, to the the country to clear up any matters. Other than that, people frequent the pages and come across info at different times and share. Yeah, see, that's right. You come in here and you say the judge didn't admit that he had mistakenly taken an oath to a corporate entity instead of the monarch, (laughs) And is now involuntary admitted to mental health for severe depression. Go and prove it. You got to prove that. Prove the judge didn't do it. Prove a negative. You do that. Yeah. Give show us them. Show us them. See other much more reasonable voices. Simply just enjoy the good news. I heard on Telegram this morning. I mean, it's like I love this. It's like you know. I heard on the Channel Nine News this morning. I heard on Telegram this morning (laughs) that you are free. And from what I read, the judge resigned and has gone on mental health leave, acknowledging his oath was to the corporate and not the Commonwealth. I cry with happiness for the outcome. You alone, in parentheses, and your unrelenting faith have now put a wedge through the WA system. For those who do not know, Wayne Glue is out. Out. Hooray! He's and charges out. dropped. Hooray! One Yay. for the people. A huge thank you to Wayne, who never gave up fighting for our rights. Truly one for the people and snapping turtles everywhere. <laughs> yes, it is. But, of course, it's all made up. What? There, 
Very good friend of the podcast, Robert Sudi, the mastermind behind the Freeman Delusion, which you should join up to. Yes, you should. Posted this ridiculous joke in a subset group and they fucking believed it. Of course they did. It's incredible. <laughs> it was just one of these cheeky experiments in that sort of cognitive dissonance of subsets and they just walked directly into it. So I'm just going to say right now, well done, Rob. Well done, Rob. Not only did you prove these people are idiots who believe anything that lines up with their dopey ideology and belief system, but you also made someone cry with happiness. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the scouts call that a good turn. Well done. You've done your good turn for the day, Rob. <laughs> well, let's just take a look at the scoreboard there, Joe. Yeah, I believe it's Subsit sub Zero and Rob Sudi, like, infinity? In millions. Yeah, millions. He, just he, he really did. He really did take him down. That's just fantastic work, and they just fell for it. The idiots. Hook, line, and sinker. Hook, line, and sinker. I, I still haven't worked it out yet. And if you haven't worked it out, keep asking the question and keep looking for the answers because it's irrelevant. And in today's rabbit hole, we're looking at a global food crisis. <clears throat> we've had the pandemic. Now it's time for the famine. And this is really not something that we're prepared to joke about at all. It's no joking matter. And it is a disgrace that the mainstream media has barely touched on it if it has mentioned it at all. I mean, I watch SBS World News and they've mentioned a couple of things, uh, not very much. And, of course, on the commercial networks and the ABC, uh, not a skerrick about this. A, a global food shortage is upon us. One thing we can happily predict is it will drive cookers crazy yes. and force them into even more cult-like bizarre behaviour. Yes, it will. They love the idea of food shortage. It plays right into their playbook. Mm. In Victoria, they've got this Agriculture Amendment Bill 2022, which you may have heard of. It's before Parliament right now, and the cookers have, as usual, turned into something evil and weird. I don't know. It's just, you know... Dan Andrews' opposition disorder. It's a fairly boring bill, which just amends a series of laws to update biosecurity powers, loosen restrictions on growing hemp. Boring shit. It's 350 pages long. Who wants to fucking read it? But it's typical of cookers to turn Good something so them. bureaucratic and like and just like systematic into some sort of dystopian fan fiction. It's what they do. So they're saying that it gives the power to authorise officers to undertake searches that are warrant without consent and without the requirement to even present ID, which is crazy. That's not happening. The usual government in my business bullshit underpins all of this made up nonsense. No. Then just go ahead and sprinkle that with wild claims like these authorised persons could just casually shoot your livestock without explanation and you've got yourself this classic food control cooker theory. They extended this to private homes where these shady authorised officers could enter your premises, seize or kill your pets and destroy any vegetable gardens you may have in your backyard. This wound up turning into, this is a quote, Premier Dan Andrews is passing a bill that prohibits people from growing their own food. And this is reported in this sort of fake news regurgitation outfit, Apex World News Online. <laughs> news you can't trust. The, <laughs> um, uh, look, this, I just have to say that this sort of government overreach stuff, particularly with the with Dan Andrews' government in Victoria, is just grist for the mill. That This is the sort of stuff that, a lot of a lot of this, you know, a lot of this stuff stays within the cults, but this stuff can actually spread out to yeah. actually people. Oh, oh, no, they're allowed to do this, and yeah. Well, actually, the Victorian Farmers Federation actually released a comment to debunk this theory, saying that these claims were false, and they had to make a point of it because the disinformation is clearly spreading outside of the usual Telegram circles and actually making it to farmers. Mm. Yeah, it, 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 like I say, it, it's the sort of disinformation that really can sort of catch like wildfire and obviously has. And cause problems. I mean, like they go as far as to claim that beekeepers will be forced to place, and this is a quote, tiny microchips on bees so they can be tracked. Well, that's going to that's gonna take a bit of work. I know. It's ridiculous. This has happened in the past with the CSIRO and there's a whole thing about bee colony that collapse and that sort of stuff. Hmm. But I mean, really, like, First they came for us and I said nothing, but then they came for the bees and I was like, oh, fuck. I mean, like, it's all <laughs> I bullshit. Honey. I need honey. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's exactly how a fairly innocuous piece of legislation turns into a complete dystopian nightmare in this dopey post-truth era where anyone can make shit up and it just goes wildfire on Telegram and then organizations like the Victorian Farmers Federation have to actually get someone to type out the ridiculous claim that 
this is a thing and it's not real. It's embarrassing. So yeah. food shortage is totally a thing. We're about to talk about it at length. But the truth of the matter is not exciting enough for cookers. So they just make this sort of shit up. And of course the cookers have managed to pivot this whole thing and make it all about Bill Gates. And while it is completely true that Bill Gates is buying up a shitload of agricultural land, it's not to control the food supply and starve everyone. It's just to make money. Yeah. Well, it mostly is, at least. A lot of money in farming. Agricultural land has a great return on investment, and Bill Gates is part philanthropist and also part filthy capitalist dog, and that is most of it. The next level of his motivation is to push farmers toward more efficient crops and GMO, agri-tech solutions, which, let's face it, with 7 billion people on the planet, we're going to need this if we all yeah, want to eat. We sure are. It's kind of just the way it's going. Most people will be aware of how cookers feel about GMO food. They're not exactly big on it. No, they can't, not they, really. They, not, they, con- they, not, not quite convinced at the no, moment. No, they, 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 they think, you know, Frankenfood's a bit of a thing for them. But as per usual, it doesn't impact them. Like, no. not much at all. And while there might be this sort of Frankenstein soy protein in their Woolies tofu patty somewhere... Not much in Australia, to be honest. Reliance on GMO or genetically modified organisms will be the thing that feeds the poor in the future. The whingy middle class in Australia aren't eating GMO. It's people in fucking Africa who have the option of starvation or GMO crops. So it's ridiculous when you see cookers protesting this concept like they have any horse in the fucking race. And while it remains to be seen exactly what Bill Gates has planned for all this farmland... For the most part, it's just rent-seeking behavior from a really rich guy who wants to get richer. Ironically, the whole plan to get richer is he can then pump it back into philanthropy projects, despite the fact that he's kind of doing shady shit with the money. Anyway, that's a whole other podcast. (laughs) Now we're going to get sued again. It drives me nuts. (laughs) He's he's, he's not evil, but he's also not not evil. Anyway, he has got a charity to improve access to agri-tech. He's the non-evil part. In developing countries, this isn't it. That's nothing to do with his farmland. He has so many fingers and so many pies, you can't keep track of it. But that's not exciting enough for cookers to whinge about. It doesn't get them off. Yeah, look, it's, it, it is said, you know, when we're talking about these things, or the, the only people who can who, who use organic foods are those that are too poor to to afford fertilisers. Yeah. Or, or, or those who are so wealthy that they can pick and choose. Yeah, 100%. Exactly it. And these motherfuckers should not have a say in what happens in the developing world when it comes to getting food on the table. So while Bill Gates features on the radar of conspiracy theorists because they hate him because he supports vaccinations, fucking idiots, Yeah, this sort of scarcity, like this food scarcity thing, he's not even in it. And he's not even a big fish in the la- in the land game. Jeff Bezos, who is objectively evil, I mean, he'd be Lex Luthor if he was cooler, owns more farmland than Gates. Elon Musk is Lex Luthor. Gates is 49th on the list. And Jeff Bezos, as far as landowners go, agricultural landowners in the US goes, he's 25th on the list. He's mm. so much further up. But cookers just love that same day delivery. So you've got to give him a free pass, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, he gets away with it. Yeah. Ah, I mean, like what? You know, no one likes Bill Gates, but... I love getting toothbrushes hours later from the internet. (laughs) So as with anything, look. Delivered by drones. Exactly. (laughs) GMO drones. But it's just dopey fan fiction. They're pushing this dystopian fantasy because this gives their lives meaning. And honestly, I'm just going to say, Jack, there's not much more to it than that. Yeah, and that's the cooker angle. But that's enough about cooking. Yes, it is. We already know they're going to hijack this crisis and flip it into something even more awful, if that's possible. A new world order, whatever the fuck. Make it all about about them. Uh, But it's our job in the Conditional Release Program to tell you why this is going to happen or why it is happening right now, this global food crisis. And sadly, uh, there is very little we can do about it. It is coming at a blistering rate. And it is going to be just awful for the planet. I would say worse than the pandemic in terms of direct lives lost, no doubt about it. Is there any possibility that my complaining will feed some people on the other side <laughs> yeah. of the earth? Because I'll do we're, a lot of that. We're just locked in, and, and I'll explain why in a, as we go. Over the past two years, we've grown used to food, especially fresh foods, becoming more expensive. You would yeah. see uh, iceberg lettuce jar, about five bucks at the moment. That is That's so directly attributable to floods in um, in northern New South Wales, by yeah. the way. 
Uh, that's directly so. COVID has strangled supply lines, and that was the case, and remains so in the and will remain so in the immediate future. But the world is facing greater problems: the inability to feed itself due to a pincer movement of supply chain restraints, which we talked about, combined more seriously with extreme weather events driven by climate change and a chronic shortage of inorganic or chemical fertilisers driven by war in the Ukraine. Bastards. Ukraine. It will lead to continued higher prices of food in the developed world, but in the developing world, in Asia, Africa and the Middle East, rising uh, prices and chronic shortages will lead to political unrest, Uh-oh. geopolitical instability generally, and starvation for the world's poorest people. Mm. A 2020 estimate put between 119 and 124 million people People on the planet uh, living in extreme poverty. That was in 2020. That's fucking crazy. But a UN-backed report on global food crises 2022 reported, Joel, in 2021. In 2021, almost 40 million people were facing emergency or worse conditions across 36 countries. One of critical concern were over half a million people, 570,000, facing catastrophe, starvation, and death in four countries. Ethiopia, South Sudan, Southern Madagascar, and Yemen. Not mm-hmm. good place to live right now. The number of people facing these dire conditions is four times that observed in 2020 and seven times higher than in 2016. During the first half of 2021, localized areas in South Sudan continued to face famine. An additional 236 million people were in food stress across 41 countries and territories in 2021 and required livelihood support and assistance for disaster risk reduction to prevent them from slipping into worse levels of acute food security. Like worse levels? Is there a worse level than yeah, that? Well, those numbers, those numbers from 2021 are reported just recently in a report that was released in April. There, there'll be a, a, at least about to double. So that 236 million people in food stress, that will become half a billion easily, if not worse. I mean, there's lots of things that can still go wrong, that, get, that are going horribly wrong, that can still go even wronger. And we'll go through those in a minute too. Those people facing catastrophe, you mentioned them, Joel, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Southern Madagascar and Yemen. And three of those countries obviously are in, engaged in conflict and families Famine, generally speaking, has a, a root human or political cause. So you can see that there. In South Madagascar, they've faced four consecutive years of drought and they are in terrible, terrible state there. There are some political issues in the background, but it's essentially it is being driven by extreme weather conditions, four consecutive years of drought in South, South Madagascar. A famine is set to explode around the world due to a chronic shortage of inorganic or chemical fertilisers. Mm. This is not a conspiracy theory. It is happening right now and is going to get worse. And let me explain why. Russia is the world's largest exporter of superphosphate. Ooh, super. Ukraine is the world's number four exporter and number one in the export of other inorganic fertilisers like ammonia. So those two countries provide a great deal of the world's fertilisers. China, which accounts for about one-tenth of urea and one-third of another important farm input of diammonium phosphate, closed off exports until ex- until next June to ensure local farmers have enough supply. Russia has curbed fertiliser exports for six months. So you think, oh, okay, maybe it'll be over in a year or so. Yeah. We've got this conflict that's just running all the time. Yeah. So the world needs chemical fertilisers to feed a growing global population. Inorganic fertilizers like superphosphate have supercharged production. If we look at wheat, for example, crop yields of wheat in Australia were 0.9 of a metric tonne per hectare in the 1930s. Now it is 2.2 metric tonnes per hectare, more than double and that in an environment of declining rainfall. Enhanced irrigation and water saving techniques have come to the rescue, but you, you see that you're more than double production on the same patch of land yeah. w- with uh, with uh, chemical fertiliser. Yeah. And when we show the preconditions for famine are occurring right now, we see them in the price of wheat skyrocketing around the world. It's $390 per tonne on EU markets. That's of the 9th of May this year. In January 2020, it was $194.50. And those prices are in Australian dollars. So it's doubled. The the price of wheat has doubled. And with most of the price hike coming in the last six months. And this is due in no small way to Russia's poor wheat crop last year in 2021, driven by drought. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat. Australia is sixth, by the way. Ukraine fourth. 
China produces the most wheat but doesn't export any. It's all for domestic consumption. Yeah. After Russia, in order, the world's largest exporters are the US, number two, Canada, three, Ukraine, France, and Australia. We made it. And the wheat markets in Australia are all tied up. Basically, you know, the Chinese just say, we want it. And they go, yeah, sure. You're going to pay $390 yeah. a tonne? They go, yeah. They go, Three bags right. full. Now, with conflict in the Ukraine, wheat crops will be poor there and in Russia, and the price will continue to rise. And the first manifestation of the global wheat shortage will almost certainly be social and political tensions in the Middle East. Ugh. Hungry people are angry people. Yes, right? they are. That's what I've been thinking this whole entire fucking thing. Yeah. How pissed off and violent would you be if you were that hungry? Look, it's really interesting. that There are two price indicators around the world that point directly to political stability or, or otherwise. One is the price of pork in China. Ah. The other, the price of wheat in the Middle East. Yeah, okay. So the price of pork in China is down 2.6% this year. Happy, hey. Hey, happy, happy, good time. Good, good news for China and the PRC, whose greatest fear is famine. We can explore on this a little bit because this is what keeps the leaders of the, of the People's Republic of China awake at night. Famine. Yeah. China has a long history of famine. Mao, uh, not good. Uh, and uh, going back, I mean, some of the world's biggest catastrophes uh, uh, are, China, are famines, famines in China in the last 200 years. Yep. So these things really run um, uh, active and um, in their history. And so that is that is the thing that can bring down governments. Yeah, that is you don't the want a billion angry simply- Chinese. Yeah, hungry people are angry people. That's what you said. That's fucking right, man. But the sharp spike in the price of wheat is not good news for the Middle East. Uh, <clears throat> there will be bread rights. You can oh, set your watch by it. You know, it will happen around September, October. I, you know, I guarantee you this is going to happen. Oh. There's just no way that, you know, I'm not just sort of wild speculation. You're looking into the future. If you're wrong, you're, we're going to get dragged. You know that, uh, right? It, it, it will happen, Joel. It will happen around September, October, possibly earlier. Fuck. And probably first in Lebanon, where the idiots who run the country blew up their own major port in Beirut. That was and, and with it, their grain storage facilities. And then Egypt. You know, people may remember the so-called Arab Spring uprising of 2011. It started as a bread riot in Cairo. That's Did how it? it started. Yeah. Uh, Ah, okay. So that's coming. <clears throat> now, Russia's wheat crop was poor last year, as I said, down around 25% driven by drought. Uh, the Russians have already told their satellites, the Stans, you know, Kazakhstan and others, there's a sort of economic trade group uh, that, mm-hmm. that runs through the Stans in the old Soviet Union. And the, and the Russians Becky, have Becky told Becky Stan, Stan? Yeah, all of those. All of those, including, all of a, including that one you just made up. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> there will be no exports beyond the orders that have that have already been received. The Russians have told them, "You put your orders in, you will we'll fill the orders. After that, nah, we can't. We're not doing any more exports." That's not good. That's because they had a poor crop. I mean, it's not due to war. <laughs> that that stuff's all coming. That's coming in the next year and two. Oh. Ukrainian crop production, you know, can expect to be poor next year for for rather obvious reasons. Yeah. So immediately we have a global shortage of wheat and grains generally. There are other shortages too, which are having an immediate effect on consumption around the world. U- Ukraine is the biggest producer and exporter of sunflower oil, Joel. Oh. Or it was. Oh, yeah. The shortage has, in the UK, led to a store limit of two litres of cooking oil per customer in Tesco's. It's estimated that as many as half of UK's chippies will be forced to close. Just what? too expensive. To be fair, your chips are shit, so whatever. I don't know. Sometimes they're really, really nice. They're I so do soggy. Like their cod. I do like their cod. Yeah. Anyway, in the West, there are alternatives, but they are more expensive and more difficult to access. Rapeseed oil is one that they're using, but it's three times the price of sunflower oil. That's not good. So fried foods are the staples of the world. In the developing world, the shortage of cooking oil will be catastrophic. In Indonesia, the world's largest provider of palm oil has placed an export ban on palm oil. No. So they're not, you know, that's that's a, a heavily contentious sort of crop anyway because they're stripping forests and what have you to uh, to put in palm oil, uh, palm oil production. But they are saying to uh, particularly uh, trade uh, trading partners in Southeast Asia, we we're not we're not going to give you any more palm oil. That's interesting because like. One of the things we were talking about earlier was the whole sort of Western decadence of being able to complain about foods and boycott them and be quite aggressive about them when it doesn't really impact you. The idea that they're putting a, 
export ban on palm oils means the demand is way outstripping supply. Yeah. And the idea of a few people back here saying, I like orangutans, I'll never use palm oil, is clearly not touching the sides of the industry. Right. So you can piss and moan and bitch and scream all you like about certain things, but some products are inelastic as fuck and your dumbass little middle-class boycotts mean nothing because people are hungry. That's right. It's exactly right. And, uh, and and like I say, you know, cooking oil is just an essential. It's just an essential uh, throughout Asia, throughout the Middle East, throughout Africa, yeah, uh, throughout the developing world. Yeah. And so these are here in our problems. They, these are happening right now. Uh-huh. <clears throat> they may be solved by switching to alternatives, but that will take time and money. You can't just turn around, establish chains of production yeah. just overnight. So Especially at this scale. And while the conflict in Ukraine rages, these problems will continue to push more and more people into poverty around the world. In the West, even in Australia, which is more than self-sufficient, I think we make almost twice the food than we need. Yeah, it sounds about um, right. We're a food bowl. And so the rest is export. Um, but we'll find that food will continue to become more expensive. Uh, <clears throat> in the but in the developing world, it will become an existential threat to millions of people. Because like when it comes down to it, if it comes a thing of who's the highest bidder, we will eventually be the highest bidder. We don't want to pay $15 a kilo for capsicums, but if we have to, we will. Whereas in Indonesia and other places that do rely on our exports, where we always whinge about the fact that we're not getting this and we're not getting that because we're sending it overseas, we will stop because mm-hmm. most of the country can't afford to outbid us. We don't want to get into a bidding war, but if we do, we're going to win because we're a developed country. And this is the kind of thing. We'll whinge about the expense of groceries, but we're not going to go without. Yeah, but and still at the same time, you've got, you've got you know, people living on the brink of, of of poverty in Australia and many people in poverty. Oh, true, true. But people, I guess the best term, and it's, a, it's a little bit... Um, uh, a little bit of a cliche is the bread, the bread line, and so yeah. the, these people will, you know, at very, at very least, they will move away more and more from fruit, from fresh from fruit, fruit and yeah. vegetables, and yeah. so forth because they're going to be more expensive and eat but, shit. But but then the problem with the oil is the problem with cooking oils is going to mean you know your your KFC chips and chicken buckets are going to be more expensive too. Yeah, it's a bit of a nightmare like that. When it comes down to it also, the externalization of bad diets to the medical system is the kind of sort of false economy where you end up pushing up prices of good food that ends up having an effect on people's choices. And that choice winds them up on fucking insulin injections, which we subsidize. I mean, like it's a very dis- disconnected yeah. and economic way to look at it. Yeah, and, and, and Australia won't be unharmed. You and I might be able to say, you know, that we might have to forego some things because they might be a bit expensive. I'm not buying fucking capsicums. They piss me off so much. <laughs> I always buy a few. They are fucking expensive. So they? expensive. About 20 bucks a kilo. It's disgusting. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you find people who are uh, on the bread line, so to speak, you know, they're, they're going to, you know, they're going to, plunge into poverty they will change they will change their preferences based on the market and those preferences may be deleterious to their health and the the government will pick up that tab anyway they'll go hungry some will go hungry mate yes some will some will because a landlord doesn't take excuses now imagine all this stuff but we're just talking about grains for example so if we're talking about grains the, the the shortage the global shortage of of chemical fertilizers and then you compound that i mean so this this is a little bit of speculation but though that the, 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 the shortage in, in, in chemical fertilisers is, is existing here in our problem. So you, you know you're going to have reduced crop yields. But imagine then you have an extreme weather event driven by climate change in North America, which yeah. provides the second and third most you know, exported uh, exports of, of grains and wheat in particular. We have a problem. And then, then you know, you, you, your cactus. Now that's that may happen, but it, it it's not happening now. What we do have is this big future problem: shortage of fertilisers, and this is now leading to a reduction of grain yields in South Asia. South Asia, right now at around ten percent. So, in the space of just twelve months since this um, shortage of of, of uh, chemical fertilisers come into being, we've got a reduction in crop yields in South Asia are at 10% in grains. So it will get worse for as long as the conflict in the U- Ukraine goes on. And it's a shortage of nitrogenous and phosphate fertilisers uh, and it will render the world unable to feel its, feed itself. Yeah. 
And if we need a proof, we've got a little microcosm of this that we can actually look at to see what happens. If we need a proof, and it basically it's in Sri Lanka, and it was all political. Um, it, was, it wasn't driven by, obviously, there was no conflict in Ukraine in 2019 no. uh, when there was a change of government in the country and the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa to the presidency. Uh, the government is described as an alliance of left-wing ideologies from the centre to the extreme, but that's really only half the story. It's almost sort of outside of ideology, this stuff. And Sri Lanka is a country ruled by political elites and Rajapaksa is one of their number. So you've got this sort of inbuilt structural oligarchy going on in Sri Lanka. Ideology almost doesn't count. By the way, Rajapaksa is, is suspected of war crimes committed during the Sri Lankan Civil War, especially in the latter parts of, of the war when um, the Tamil Tigers were uh, routed in the northern part of Sri Lanka. And, uh, there are many questions that Rose Parks has got to answer, but for now, he's the president of Sri Lanka. Uh, the Sri Lankan economy has structural balance of payments issues. It imports far more than it exports, and, and it has been since independence in 1948. And that means foreign currency is scarce. So Rose Parks and his cronies thought it might be a good idea to place a ban on the import of chemical fertilisers to ease the burden yeah. on, on, the, on the economy. And the ban was sold to Sri Lanka's farmers as a switch to organic farming. Yay! Yeah, pictures were painted, you know, everyone went, oh, it's going to be great, you know, everyone's going to love it. We're going to be the home of organic farming. And the ban, this is just, this is less than, this is less than the, you know, sort of a year ago. The ban actually began in May 21, and it led to a disaster in the space of just one harvest, you know. The country had been self-sufficient in rice. It's not anymore and was re required to import it by the kiloton. I mean, think about $300 million worth of purchases of rice had to come into the country that a year before weren't Jesus. required. The rice yield dropped uh, to 2.92 million tonnes in 2021-22, down from the previous year's 3.39. So we've got almost a third of decline in crop yield. And that created a price surge and led to starvation because it's a staple in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So the, the Sri Lankan economy relies on tourism, so, so it, it got the double whammy. It got the smash from COVID. And the, main, the other big earner is tea. And the ban on chemical fertilisers reduced tea yields by 60% in the space of two harvests. So oh. if you have your 20, 20 harvest, everything went very nicely there. And it's 60% down the following year, last year. And at one level, there's <laughs> a lesson. And that's, it's, this is what happens when you go, when you choose to go organic. You know, we could yep. fluff, fluff around the northern rivers and do all these sorts of things. But in areas where food is absolutely essential um, uh, to, to keep people alive, to keep people from starvation, um, you know, uh, it, it, it's just uh, it, it's just obvious. Look, the problems for Sri Lanka's farmers were it wasn't just a, an organic versus inorganic argument. The problems for Sri Lanka's farmers were compounded by a lack of you know of of organic fertilisers. So, so when the government made this crazy leap in policy, it didn't support the farmers in in terms of giving them. Uh, organic fertilisers or providing access to organic fertilisers. Yeah, it seems there's no strategy at all. Yeah. I mean, like, the thing that annoys me, as you said, the Northern Rivers, I got a little sort of peat triggered there because there is this <laughs> guilt trip around like, you know, are you eating organic? And if you're not, you're right. going to die. And, you know, this is the total cooker thing, but it's that kind of thing where it's like, okay, you have the luxury of saying – if you don't eat organic, you're going to die because your life doesn't depend on it. I mean, harping on the whole episode, but it fundamentally shits me that people could be in a position of privilege like that and then turn around and say that Bill Gates is trying to depopulate the world and the New World Order is trying to kill everyone off en masse. You know what, mate? If you were actually equal with the rest of the world, you would have a choice. You would either depopulate the world or eat organic food. You can't fucking have both. And I'm telling you right now, if Pete Evans was put in a position where it was between organic grass-fed salmon and depopulating developing countries, he would press a button and they would fucking die. Yeah. I'm just saying that right now. There's no way. Based on nothing, of course, because organic food, while it is lovely and probably has got less glyphosates and shit in it, realistically, what's the difference? Who gives a fuck? Who gives a yeah. fuck? Just 
eat something. Yeah, look, just to, just to, just to wrap up the Sri Lankan story, the 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 ban on on uh, chemical fertilizers was lifted in November of last year. So that experiment went didn't last uh, long. Went about six months. Jesus. And look and look at the look what it's led to. You know, bad and, timing and, too. And anyone who follows, in anyone who follows global news, will tell you there are thousands of people now on the streets in in, uh, in the capital of Sri Lanka in Colombo, and 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 basically calling for Rose Parks and the government to be removed. There's great political instability uh, all around the place. This hungry is hungry people basic, are angry. Hungry people are angry people, and yeah. it is estimated that this disastrous experiment has pushed 500,000, half a million Fuck. of the island nation's 22 million people into extreme poverty. Imagine that in Australia. So I guess the, the great awfulness about all of this is that many of those half million would have emerged from extreme poverty in the last 10 to 15, 20 years and now go back into Be it. Be plunged back into it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that sucks. Yeah, but what this all teaches us is High-intensity farming with chemical fertilisers is the only way to feed the world's population. If you're, you know, you're middle class and you want to eat fucking artisanal bread and <laughs> apple with apples with fucking great big bruises all over them, go for your life. No worries. I don't care. I don't really care if you do that, but you, you, you cannot feed the world this way. No. Uh, and uh, we were talking about... Um, Organic fertilizers, Joel, and this is something I never thought I'd have to say, but there is a global shortage of manure. <laughs> the world is short of shit. I, yeah. don't, I, I just, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you how shocked I am to hear that. But because this is coming in on the back of the the shortage of uh, of uh, of chemical fertilizers, that people now uh, need shit. And there's just a chronic shortage of it. In the wake of the shortage of chemical fertilisers, the Green Market's North American Fertiliser Price Index. I bet you didn't know there was one, Joel. I do know. But there is. And the price of uh, fertiliser, manure, is $1,072.87 US cents per tonne. A ton of shit is worth a thousand, more than a thousand dollars US, about fourteen, fifteen hundred Australian. That's a shit ton of money, Jack. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe there are a couple of angles we haven't worked through just at the moment. But maybe I'm flushing a gold mine every morning. <laughs> I would have dropped two or three hundred dollars this morning. <laughs> Anyway, shouldn't be laughing about any of this. No, but that's no. it. You know, this is where we got to. You know, the shit yeah. is now. Shit is now. Generally speaking, animal shit, pigs, cows, uh, etc., uh, is running at a, over a thousand dollars US per ton. Brown gold, Texas tea. Yeah, and and, and it's true that some uh, some cattle farmers, for example, pig farmers too, that they're, they're actually. They used to just mop that shit out, you know, and, and now they're actually storing it and selling it. Um, uh, in China, uh, urea has soared more than 200. The price of urea, which is basically the major component of piss, has soared more than 200% this year to a record. Now, basically, the urea is required. It can be used as a, an organic uh, fertiliser, but it's generally used... Uh, to make, there's a chemical process that can go on that create ammonia style uh, nitrogenous nitrogenous nitrogen nitrogenous uh, fertilizers. Um, so you think urea? <laughs> there's something we got lots of. Guess who's the biggest supplier of urea in the world, Joe? Fucking Russia, isn't it? Ukraine. No, no, Ukraine. it's Ukraine. It's Ukraine. God damn it! So this is basically no way out. No way out. No way out. Of, what, of what's coming. This is uh, this is one of those things where it's like that perfect storm where you got Sri yeah. Lanka putting themselves back a decade and six months. You've got Russia and Ukraine in a conflict. Oh, well, they're just it, 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 it becomes a, an unsolvable conflict. I mean, maybe within a year or two it might ease back. Maybe within a week or or months, possibly. But I don't think that's going to happen. There's a lot of unknown unknowns that are very unknown. Yeah. Look, I mean, certainly that would. That would have, you know, if if conflict came to an end there, some form of peace peace was reached in in the, in the growing year. Once you get a crop in, you're still sort of six months a, a year down the track. 
before you can start doing those things again. Oh, yeah. It has a huge lag. Huge. Yeah. As I say, already grain crop yields, including rice, are down in South Asia by just under 10%. That's that's the, what the current emergency has caused. And so it, just get, it, it will get worse as the supply of superphosphates and other chemical fertilisers dry out. Yeah. In the West, we'll see this as a major inconvenience. Prices of food will rise, but overall, it will impact worse on those who can afford it least. In this country, those on the breadline will have to battle, as we said before, but in the developing world, there'll be starvation. That this is start. a famine, you know. Yeah. You'd think after two years of the pandemic, we could expect a little respite, but what is coming may end up being worse than COVID-19, worse in terms of rates of malnutrition, rates of premature deaths and rates of people hurled into extreme poverty, where the UN estimates of a further 193 million people would descend this year alone. 7 billion population, almost 200 million people will be added to the pile of those in extreme poverty. That's fucked. We've had the pandemic, folks. Now it's time for global famine. Great. But we have to leave the imminent death of millions of people there because now it's time for a man who could fix the global food crisis by serving grass-fed salmon on a little steam kale with a white wine with a white wine sauce drivelled over it for one hundred and fifty dollars a plate. Problem solved. Easy. Thank you, Pete. Peace and Pete's peace. had a big week, and we're about to hear all about it in the week in Pete Evans. <laughs> So I'm going to be honest with you guys, it has not been a huge work in Pete Evans. Not huge? No, it really hasn't. While Pete's still posting the usual nonsense, you know, Tucker Carlson clips and the general bullshit, he's not really up to much. So he stopped posting his hot takes on things, much to my disappointment, oh. and he's spending more time pushing his overpriced Evolve Sanctuary retreats because, well, <laughs> as we said many times before, grass-fed salmon ain't cheap it ain't, and it, it don't ain't. pay for itself. Well, uh-huh. That's right. So scrolling through Pete's Peace Week efforts this week in a desperation for a bit, I saw a meme that caught my attention. It shows two teenagers texting each other. The girl says, I can't wait for everything to go back to normal. And the boy underneath says, Project Blue Beam is next. Oh. So half curious, half bored, and half desperate, I punch Project Blue Beam into Duck, Duck, Go. Pete. Either you posted this without knowing what it is because you're an impulsive idiot or you actually believe this is a thing. Both of these options are not good for your character. No, not good. It's just concerning and you need to seek help. Either way, you fucking rube. So in 1994, a Canadian writer and journalist named Serge Monast came up with the idea of Project Bluebeam. Project Bluebeam. A four-step project designed by NASA and the UN to essentially stage a cataclysmic event on Earth by simulating the rapture and convincing the entire planet to follow a New Age religion created by the New World Order, which, of course, is led by the Antichrist. For fuck's sake, Pete, do you seriously believe this shit? Fuck, come on. Where is your bullshit filter? So the first ever Bluebeam is artificially created earthquakes, which will unearth artifacts and ancient relics, which will prove that religion as we know it completely misinterpreted, discredit a lot and of And God them. is angry. Good. Well, I mean, <laughs> the new God is everything. Yeah. So the second step is to project these 3D holograms into the sky, involving, and this is a quote, projections of Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, etc. They will merge Ooh. into one. It's, it's, bu- it's Buddha's birthday, by the way, today, Joe. Happy birthday, Buddha. Oh, bless. You'll be projected for your present. <laughs> so... This is to simultaneously convince everyone on Earth this new merged being is the one true Uh God. Now, the God will conveniently speak from the hologram in the local languages where it's being displayed Uh in the sky, and this is this sort of rapture-like event where, like, apparently a simulated sort of second coming turns into this sort of new world religion overnight. Or depending on who you ask, it'll pave the way to holy wars to depopulate the planet in a form of calculated resistance to the new religion. After that night of the thousand stars, humanity is believed to be ready for them to enter in a new messiah to re-establish peace everywhere at any cost, even at the cost of freedom! So you can see why I got you to do yeah. that, right? So the third step is, Love and this it. one sounds like fun, The New World Order uses telephonic communication to convince you that this new god is actually speaking to you from inside. This is a quote from the guy who wrote this nonsense. It's coming from inside the house. It's coming from inside your brain. 
convincing each of them that their own God is speaking to them from the very depths of their own soul. This is oh. right. It's only this stuff. Yeah, it really fucking is. So now that's often called paranoid schizophrenia. Yes. But Monast explains, and the word explain is used very loosely here, how this will work. Such rays work. from satellites are fed from the memories of computers that have stored massive data about every human on Earth and their languages. The rays will then interlace what? with their natural thinking to form what we call diffuse artificial thought. Yeah, that wasn't easy to read because that is fucking word salad. No, nah, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Mm. Word salad. So, and okay, so now we're going to move on to the fourth step. And this one's also a lot of fun. The evil masterminds behind the Project Bluebeam will use all these technologies, including the holograms and the telepathy, to convince people that an alien invasion is taking uh-huh. place. Like, okay. I didn't think we needed this because I thought we already had the religion. <laughs> this and make happened. everyone shit their pants. So we've got a new god, but we've also got an uh, ex- existential threat. The terrified populace will, of course, be easier uh-huh. to control and lay the path for the new world order to take over seamlessly. Either way, whatever happens, you yep. get in control. We're, we're just figuring out ways to make it work, and that's happening. That's, that's, that is in yep. the plan. Yep, yep, I see how it works now. Personally, I thought this got resolved with the big hologram show. The rapture event, we have the new world religion, and then God tells us stuff in our head. I mean, that mm-hmm. felt good. But now we've got the alien false flag in here where we've got to be it's scared just, of aliens. I mean, like, down. it just seems like a lot. So Manas had a great quote on this one. I would suggest investigate this information carefully before dismissing it as fanatic lunacy. Yeah, I'm just going to... And I'll just translate that, Joel. Do your own research. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just going to say this right now. I suggest you don't because this is actually boring (laughs) as fuck. I read way more than I'm letting on here and I abbreviated this to the point of being a stub. It's so absurd. It's so stupid. And I'm just going to appeal to you, Pete. Pete, mate, really? I mean, look, I get it. You're a bit of a hippie and you're scared of needles. (laughs) I get it. But this... Like, either you have no fucking idea what you're sharing, but you mindlessly share counter-narratives because you're addicted to it, you're an intellectual nobody with this rebellion (laughs) complex, or you've actually looked into this. You've looked at the same websites I have, and you actually fucking believe it. Either way, this is just further proof that you're about as deep as a paddling pool, and you need to stop posting publicly immediately. And you have been listening to the Conditional Release Program with your hosts, Jack the Insider and Joel Hill. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. And if you've enjoyed our bullshit, throw us a five-star review on your podcast app. And Jack can be found on Twitter on at Jack the Insider and Joel on at Currency Moses with a K. We've set up a Facebook page. You can find it easily. Just search the name of the podcast. No one else has called us. All you'll get is results for parole programs in Virginia. <laughs> Seriously, that's what you get. It's pretty funny. Know, now, promoting a podcast is easier said than done. If you'd share this episode or a past episode, we would yes, appreciate please. it a lot because it's really embarrassing to do it ourselves. And let's face it, our numbers are growing, but fucking slowly. Do your jobs. Come on. And the Patreon is up and running, and we ask listeners to consider throwing a few dollars our way. We're asking again. Yes, we're asking again because we're doing and the back we, and, and if we the have to ask now. again, we'll have to start begging. Well, that's it. And believe me, you wouldn't like us when we beg. For as little as $5 a month, you have access to all sorts of bonus content. And we'll put some more up there soon. We're going to do some true crime stuff with Jack. We're going to do all sorts of stuff. We've yes, got plans. coming tomorrow. We've got plans. We've got, we've got ideas. But if you give us more money, you get a whole bunch of other benefits. You can even record, re- watch us record the show yes, live, yeah. live on air. We mute you, though. You, you can't speak. If we do get to a thousand patrons, and it could happen, we promise that Jack will grow kale in his backyard and fertilize it with his own manure. Mm. That's a nice way of saying shit. It is, it is, and that's what you'll—that's what it'll be fertilized with. Absolutely, great big three hundred gram chunkers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's uh, staying in the show. So join up. I'm not editing. At Patreon.com/slash the conditional release program. Don't make me do this. And finally, all <laughs> feedback, tips, and death threats should be sent to the conditional release program at gmail.com. That's the conditional release program at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you, even if it's to complain about the price of bread in downtown Beirut. Amen. Thanks, listeners. Thanks, guys. See ya. See ya. <laughs>